Hi, in this screencast, we're going to learn about drag force and terminal velocity. Let's get started. Okay, so yesterday we talked about Newton's second law. So Newton's second law tells us that uh, the acceleration experienced by an object is directly proportional to the net force acting on the object and inversely proportional to its mass. So let's see, let's just take a look at an example of that. So uh, I have an object here, it's a, a t an object unknown mass, but it's sliding at 20 meters per second to the right, all right? And there's a four Newton force acting on it to the right and a 12 Newton force acting to the left. Now let's just call the right the positive direction, call the left the negative direction. In that case, when I sum up these two forces, I'm gonna see that the, the net force acting on it is eight Newtons in the negative direction. Since it's moving in the positive direction and there's a force acting in the negative direction, the object will accelerate in the direction of the net force. So therefore, there's a negative acceleration acting on a, an object moving in the positive direction. That object is gonna slow down. Uh, so instead of going 20, it's not going 5. Eventually, it will stop and end up going in the negative direction. On the other hand, what if the sum of those forces was 0 rather than non-zero? <clears throat> so in this case, I have 12 Newtons acting in the positive direction and 12 Newtons acting in the negative. 12 minus 12 is 0. Since the net force is 0, the acceleration is 0, meaning the object is not going to change its motion. If it started off going 20 meters per second to the right, it will continue going 20 meters per second to the right. Very important. And they will ask you a million ways on the AP test to see if you understand that it does not take a force to keep an object moving. It takes a force to change the motion of an object. So in the absence of a net force, the object simply continues going the same speed in the same direction. Now let's talk about Newton's third law. So Newton's third law tells us that when two objects interact with each other, they apply a force to each other that is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And that's going to be very important in order, in order to understand drag force and terminal velocity. So let's just look at this. I have an object that is moving, and I have an object at rest. For the sake of argument, let's just say they have the same mass, although it doesn't really matter. When the one that is moving collides with the one that is stationary, there's, they're going to interact with each other, which means there's going to be a force acting between them. This force will be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Now, what's that going to do to their motion? Well, this one was initially at rest, and now there's a force acting on it in the positive direction, so it's going to speed up in the positive direction. It was going zero, now it's moving in the positive direction. Now, this other one was traveling at a high speed in the positive direction, a force acting momentarily in the negative direction, causing it to slow down. So they're both moving to the right, but slower. Now, we'll learn a lot more about this when we study momentum conservation later in the year, but the point is, the faster object in an interaction like this is going to end up going slower. Now, let's change this slightly and have the object, instead of sliding across a, a horizontal frictionless surface, like they love to have in AP physics, instead, it's falling downward through the air or some other fluid. In that case, as it falls downward, now, just so you know, on the AP test, they will usually say, uh, you may consider air air resistance to be negligible. Sometimes they call it air resistance, they'll call it drag force, they'll call it air friction. Bottom line, so you should say it's negligible, don't worry about it. But every once in a while they'll say, and, and air resistance is non-negligible. That means you do need to think about how it's going to affect the motion of the object. So let's think about this. This object is falling down, it's going to collide with particles of air. Just like in the last slide, when I collide with them, the objects that were initially at rest, these air molecules are going to get pushed downwards with a certain amount of force. That same force is going to act upwards on this object, causing it to, to slow down. Now, keep in mind, there's two different forces acting on it. There's the, the gravitation, the mg pulling down this, and then there's the, the collisional force pushing upward on this. So let's just try this. I've got an object of 400, like a 40 kilogram object. So it's being pulled down by gravity 400 newtons. I let it go. The inside I let it go is velocity is zero. And since it's not moving through the air, it's not hitting any particles. So the drag force acting on it is zero. So there's only one force acting on it, gravitation, mg. So of 400 newtons acting on a 40 kilogram object will make it accelerate at g, 10 meters per second squared. Now, I check in on a little bit later, this object is now traveling 20 meters per second in the downward direction. That means as it falls down, it's bumping into a bunch of particles, and each one of those puts an upward force on it. So now there is a net drag force acting on it, and that drag force is 25 newtons. Uh, now, it's being pulled down with 400, but there's 25 upwards, so the acceleration is going to be reduced now. Now it's accelerating at 9.4 meters per second per second instead of 10. Well, it just keeps falling faster and faster. Now it's going 40 meters per second. Now it's going to bump into a lot more molecules. And the bumps into more molecules are going to put even more force on it in the upper direction. Uh, and, and now it's, it's only accelerating at 7.5. And I think you can see where this is going. If it falls fast enough, this value is going to go to zero. So the idea is 
when a, an object falls fast enough, it reaches what we call terminal velocity. Terminal velocity means the fastest this object can fall through that fluid because at that velocity, the upward force of air friction or air drag or air resistance, whatever you want to call it, is equal to the downward force of gravity on that object. So since those two forces, mg downwards and drag force upward are equal to each other, the net force is zero. And remember when the net force is zero, what don't you do? You don't accelerate. It will continue to fall downwards, in this case at 80 meters per second, until some force on it changes. Now terminal velocity, we'll, we'll denote it here by V sub T, uh, and this is definitely, you do not need to know any equations about it. You don't even need to know this relationship specifically unless they set you up in it with, with some background on it. So it's nothing you need to add to your memory cells here. But just think about this. What are the things that are going to affect how fast an object has to be going in order to end up with a net drag force upward equal to its downward uh, gravitational force? Well, it's going to do with the mass of the object. The more massive an object is, the highest terminal velocity will be. So just so you know, for a human being, just if you just jumped out of an airplane, oops, I forgot my parachute, your terminal velocity is about 60 meters per second. If an elephant did the same thing, it would probably have a terminal velocity maybe a little bit higher than that, okay? So that's one thing. The other one is the area of contact. How much area is able to interact with the air molecules, right? So, so if I have something that is like uh, very flat, like a feather, it's going to bump into a lot of molecules. But if it's spherical, it's going to bump into a lot fewer of them. And the other one is the density of the fluid to which you're moving, the air density. So if it's dense air, there's lots of particles. So there's, there's more interactions occurring and more force upward being generated. Uh, so if you think about those all together, what you, feel, what you realize is, well, the reason that feathers have a lower terminal velocity than rocks is because they have a smaller mass. It takes less force to, to, to stop them from accelerating. They have a lot of surface area, so they bump into a lot of molecules. Uh, and, and that's really why they're different. That the density of it won't, won't matter here. Now, by, it's worth noting, uh, they've gone to the moon and they dropped, I think it was Apollo 15, they dropped a feather and a hammer at the same time. They fell the same. I have a video clip I'm going to show you where they, they have a NASA chamber where they can take all the air out of it. You'll see a feather and a bowling ball. Uh, fall quite a ways at the exact same acceleration. It's pretty cool. Okay, so let's talk about people now. Like, so once again, a person who is falling without a parachute on will typically uh, continue to accelerate until they reach a terminal velocity of 60 meters per second, at which point the mg downwards on their body is equal to the drag force upwards. Since the net force is zero at that velocity of 60, then they won't accelerate anymore and they will stay at 60. Now, of course, you can change. So those skydivers, they, they can turn their bodies sideways, like, kind of like that feather and arch their back, in which case they're interacting with more molecules and then they'll fall slower than 60. Or if they go into a steep dive and point themselves and really work at it, they can go faster. But I'm just saying a typical person just falling without really thinking about what they're doing, it's going to be about 60 meters per second, which, by the way, several people have uh, documented cases have survived hitting the ground at 60 meters per second. It's not 100% fatal, but you don't want to try it. Now, here's the thing. If you are falling through there, chances are you wish you had a parachute. If you open up that parachute, well, think about what happens. I'm going to hit a lot more mass isn't going to change, but I'm going to hit a lot more molecules. And therefore, my terminal velocity is going to be a lot smaller. And so instead of uh, uh, reaching, instead of falling through the air at 60 meters per second, maybe when I'm falling at five meters per second, the net upward force of drag on me equals the downward force on me. And you know what? Five meters per second is pretty much almost 100% survivable. So that's why we use parachutes. All right, so let's show this. I got to keep my eye on it. I don't want to miss the bus. Okay, so here you go. Person jumps out of the airplane. The moment they jump out, their downward velocity is zero. They, let's say it's a 60 kilogram person, so they're being pulled down, so it's 600 newtons downward. That's the net force on them because there's only gravitation. So they're gonna speed up at 10 meters per second squared, just like we always talk about. But if we check in on that person, if they've been falling a little bit, now the person's going 30 meters per second. Well, they're going 30 meters per second, they're bumping into a bunch of air molecules, so there's, a, there's an upward force as well as a downward mg force. So instead of being a net downward of 600, now there's a net downward of only 200. You're still gonna pick up speed because there's a downward force acting on you while you move downwards. But now you're only speeding up at three meters per second squared instead of 10. I check on you a little bit later and look at this, uh, Mirable, you're going 60 meters per second. The net force on you is zero because the drag force upward is equal to the gravitational force downward. So you stop accelerating and you will just continue to fall at 60 meters per second 
until something happens like you hit the ground or you open up your parachute. Now, when you open up your parachute, sometimes you will look at movies, you get the sense that maybe the person instantly starts moving upwards. They do not. They never stop moving downwards. However, as soon as this parachute opens, this person is going much faster than their new terminal velocity because they're bumping into a whole mess of molecules. So, the, it, but they're going very fast, right? So at 60, they were going enough to have a net of zero. Now they're going the same speed, but they're hitting all these molecules. So the net upward force far exceeds the downward force. So our net force is 1200 in the upward direction. They're moving down, the net force is up. So what do they do? They slow down. And it takes time to slow down. That's why if you pull your parachute right before you hit the ground, it's not gonna do much good. It takes time to slow you back down to your new terminal velocity, which we see here is five meters per second. Now, what happens is eventually that upward force, as you fall slower and slower, it will get smaller. It goes from 1,200 to 1,500, and so you get slower and slower and slower. And eventually, when you get to about 5 meters per second, the upward force of bumping all these molecules is equal to the downward force of gravity, and you no longer accelerate. Last thing here. This comes out in the AP test a lot, and it's a cool question. Okay, let's think about this. So let's just say... Uh, that I just throw an object upwards and air resistance is negligible. Well, that tells me that if I throw up at 30, it's going to go up for three seconds, right? Because acceleration equals delta V over T. Okay, so, so 0 minus 30 over negative 10 gives me three seconds. It's going to go up for three seconds, and it's going to come back down for three seconds. So the time up equal the time down. On the other hand, if air resistance is significant, here's what's going to happen. It's going to travel up for less time than it travels down. Why? Well, because there's a greater force acting in the downward direction when you're moving up and a smaller net force acting on you when you're moving in the downward direction. Let's see why. When the object is moving upwards, and my little line showing that it's moving upwards, what I find is that I have both mg, I have in both cases, but the drag force is pointing in the downward direction. So the sum of these two gives me a larger value. So the net force is mg plus the drag force. So it's more than, so, so, so it's more than mg. So my acceleration is greater than G. I'm slowing down more rapid than I would if there was no air friction. It makes sense. I'm bumping into molecules that are pushing down on me, slow, you know, cause me to slow down at a greater rate. But I reach, I reach whatever altitude I'm going to reach. Let's say it took two seconds. Now I'm going to fall back down. Ah, all of a sudden things switch. Gravity's still pulling downwards, but now the molecules I'm bumping into are pushing up on me, slowing me down. So now these two are working against each other. So now the net force is mg minus drag force. And now the acceleration I experience is less than what g is. All right. So it's going to take longer. I, I have to travel the same distance I went up. I got to come back down the same distance, but I'm accelerating slower. So of course, it's going to take me longer. It's counterintuitive, but it's a very cool question they like to ask on the test. Thanks for watching this. I'm going to make my bus.